very easily. Moving on to LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol are like all the guys in the gray shirts in the factory. It does the heavy lifting. But you can kind of think of the factory workers as you've got the new guys that just came on the job and they're full of energy and excitement and enthusiasm. And man, you tell them to do something and they jump up and they go do it. That's like a new LDL molecule. And then you've got the guys that have been there for a while, maybe closer to retirement. Maybe you have to tell them two or three times, or maybe, you know, these guys, uh, it'll get done. That's kind of like an older LDL molecule. So, so we have a lot of different kinds, a lot of different sizes. They have different functions. We have different expectations for them. So the big, fresh, giant, new ones coming into the system, we're not so worried about those. They do a really good job. Our body handles them well. The smaller and older they get, we start to get worried about those. And those smaller, older ones tend to be the ones that we find when we look at cross-sections of like a hardened artery, okay? <clears throat> because they come in different sizes, and, and different sizes mean different things in terms of good and bad, it's very difficult to get an accurate measurement that means anything when you're looking just at the LDL number on your lipid profile, okay? Remember what they do, they smash them open, and they lay the cholesterols on the counter and they count them. Well, if we do that to a bunch of LDLs, we might know all of this set of cholesterol came out of LDL molecules, but we don't know if it came out of a big LDL molecule or a little LDL molecule. So it's very hard just on that number alone to look at it and make a decision. And the last thing that you'll see is triglycerides, but again, for the sake of time, we're gonna move on from that. I also had a, a lab handle with very low. Very low density. Yeah. So what you're looking at there is another form of LDL. Right. So they're showing you and saying, well, that one's, that one's a small one, a very low density. So technology is amazing. Like we've come <laughs> so far with being able to look at this stuff. Um, there are tests that we don't run regularly right now because we're just not, we're not there yet with all the research and whatnot, but you can actually do like an M uh, uh, MRI of your blood and you can actually count out how many particles, it will measure the size out of them. So I mean, we've come a long way and who knows how many years before that will become, you know, standard practice. But when you're looking on there and you see that VLDL, they're making an attempt to try to show you, hey, with our calculation here, we're saying that it's probably about this many uh, falling trip that under that really small <coughs> LDL category. But again, it's up in the air. Kind of step back on that a little bit. The way that they get an LDL calculation is not through counting. Uh, they, use a, they use a ratio, they use a mathematical equation it's called the three-walled equation. <coughs> that comes from 1972, and it's, it's a study. And so it really encompasses well uh, the people that were in that study and all of the factors that apply to them, like we were talking about earlier today. Um, and it becomes more difficult to apply it to a really broad standard. So right now, using the free wall equation, we're accepting the fact that your LDLs could be, you know, 72% of the time accurate. And then all that 30-some percent of the time, maybe that calculation doesn't work out for people. And so that's why we kind of can't really use that number by itself. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's meaningless. I'm saying that by itself, we have to see some other things before we make decisions. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Is there any <coughs> implication of belt and banks between the LDLs and the VLDLs? Yeah, so essentially the more VLDLs you had, the worse off it would be. Okay. Right. Okay, so here is an example of a lipid panel. If you look up at the top, okay? There's some other things on here, but we'll focus up at the top. So you can see this person has a total cholesterol of 186, and over here we've got a reference range of 100 to 199 milligrams per deciliter, okay? And so, you know, where does that come from? Well, that is all regulated right now. We have uh, a standard process. We have a, a department of the CDC that actually regulates these standards. And they're all operating underneath uh, recommendations from the American Heart Association. 
Again, total cholesterol in and of itself is a hotly debated topic. If you've watched the news and the medical you know, journalism at all, you know that we're always up into debate about what does the cholesterol mean, how much comes from our food, how much comes from ourselves, what medicines we should be on. It's always up for debate. And, and why is that? Uh, if you think about when I told you before how we measure total cholesterol, we smashed open all the protein molecules and we laid all the cholesterol on the table. And what happens if a lot of yours came from good packages, packages that are functioning well? Well, maybe you have like this higher total cholesterol, but it's not so bad because a lot of it came from good packages. We can't know that just from looking at what we smashed open and laid out on the table. We've got to look deeper than that. And so it becomes a hotly contested issue about, you know, how does it play in? Because you've got, you know, one guy over here that'll say, boom, it crosses 200, I'm putting you on a statin. And you got another guy over here who says, you know, 298, I'm not too worried about it. Like, you know, what's going on there? And, then, and that's where some of that confusion comes in. Now, in 2015, the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee did something very controversial, and they removed cholesterol consumption limits from our dietary guidelines, and that created uh, a lot of uh, controversy across the board because you've got guys who, who believe you know, very firmly in these limits, and you've got probably a lot of newer people coming out of uh, uh, school now who are saying, well, we're not really seeing the evidence line up. Why did they do this? Well, remember, they, they're operating under AH, AHA guidelines, and uh, the AHA Task Force on Practice Guidelines came out with a statement, uh, current evidence suggests that total cholesterol alone is not a good predictor for atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. They didn't say that it doesn't help, but we can't put our laurels on that alone, okay? Now when it comes to the LDL range, so looking up here, we can see the LDL cholesterol and take note right here, what do you see? C-A-L-C, and that is her calculation. So we talked about that earlier, <coughs> the free will calculation. They're just being upfront about the fact that that's a calculated number. It's not necessarily your number exactly. 105, so you see it's flag. And over here it says, you don't want to go higher than 99. So this one was bar marked above high normal. Again, you know, on that, on that alone, we can't really make a treatment decision. We have to look at all of the factors that play here. Uh, and why is that? Because remember we talked about earlier, LDL packed in different sizes. So all of those may have been packaged inside of one of these very large packages. And therefore, maybe we're not concerned about something that's a little bit over the limit in light of what else we see there. All right. I'm going to draw. <clears throat> so I want you to understand this concept, uh, the LDL uh, process. We'll talk about you know, how it's created and, and what its purpose is in terms of a very simple generalized aspect. And I think if you understand this, then you can frame your decisions when it comes to cholesterol and understanding why we're worried about things when it comes to cholesterol, heart in the arteries like we talked about earlier. You know, where does all that come from? And, and you can see how it applies to you directly. So let me just draw here and I'll move over. So what I've drawn there, these represent cells, okay? And inside, we have a lumen that something travels through. Now, these cells would represent the innermost layer of your blood vessels. It's a single cell layer. And everything that happens when it comes down to the, the uh, hardening of arteries, the cardiovascular disease, happens with these layers. And so we'll focus in on, on that right there, okay? And then over here, we'll let that represent the liver. So, here's what happens. You have your blood vessels, and you have things kind of flowing this direction through the blood vessels. Now, let's just say something damages that cell right there. Well, that cell calls 911, 
It sends out an emergency signal. It's no different than if you call 911 and who shows up. They don't ask you who should we send. They send everybody. The fire department comes, the ambulance comes, right? It, it could have been for anything, but they send them all. Body is very similar. You call 911, those signals travel over to the liver. It travels to a lot of other places, but we're gonna focus in on this one aspect. <coughs> travels to the liver, and the liver hears, there's some damage, we need some materials. Let's send some out. Bricks in order, remember? So the liver manufactures LDL. Because the LDL carries the bricks and mortar to where it needs to go. Now it will manufacture that LDL until the signal stops. And it will travel through the system until it finds where the damage is. And it'll see these little signals. And it'll come on in here, right between the two cell layers there. It'll drop off its materials. And it'll exit out the other side. It can carry on and continue to find other sites of damage to deliver more materials, or it'll come right back around to the liver. The liver has little receptor sites, like we saw earlier. The liver will pull it out, recycle it, and use it for later. later. So that's the whole process. That's how it works. Yes? Is it replacing or repairing damage? Repairing damage. It will be dropping off materials. Okay. So that's perfect. Damage, repair, emergency response, that's exactly how we want it to happen, right? There's nothing wrong with that process. <laughs> how could it go wrong? Well, let's just say that damage is happening in a lot of different places in your body. So I'm going to make another damage right here. Okay. So now your liver is getting all of these 911 signals, and it's pushing out a lot of cholesterol. For generalization's sake, let's just say that the liver can handle reprocessing of about a thousand of these units a day. But you have so much damage that maybe your liver is creating 2,000 LDL. <coughs> so you're sending out 2,000 into the system and your liver can only pull back out a thousand at a time. These guys live for about two to four days before they become a problem, before they're shrunk down so much and oxidize and age so much that they just don't quite function the way that they're supposed to. So what happens when this process is going on and these guys are passing back by the liver and the liver doesn't have enough receptor sites to pull those molecules out? It has to let it pass on. It says, I'll get you later. And what do we start to see? We start to see some of these numbers go up, okay? So let's just say that this guy's been in the system for five days. So now they're getting smaller and smaller. The liver sees it and the liver says, man, we really need to get this guy out of here, but I'm so overworked, I can't pull it out. So it gives it a little marker and it tags it for removal. This one's a priority. We're pulling this out as soon as we possibly can. It also signals your immune system to say, let's try to get these guys cleaned up. 